We're going to be looking again in Galatians chapter 6, if you'd like to open your Bible there again. And uh, it's somber news to see today that there was a shooting when a congregation gathered um, in Fort Worth, Texas. And during the time that they were remembering our Lord's death, two of the members of that church lost their life. And, of course, <clears throat> this past week, you may have seen in the news that there have been several attacks in New York that have been directed against those who are Jewish, those who are wearing some of the traditional garb and symbols of Judaism. We recognize that in a fallen world, there is crime, but when you see crimes particularly directed at people just because of their religious beliefs. It's, it's very sad. I never thought in my wildest dreams as a child that there would come a day in America where I would see in the news that Jewish people in New York were openly wondering whether they could go in public wearing a yarmulke or some other symbol of Judaism. Or that Christians <clears throat> would have to worry about people just coming in and opening fire. So, <clears throat> it was a sad day to see that news, and it's sad to realize that these things are so commonplace. I'm very grateful <clears throat> that our overseers here in the congregation have taken seriously the need to have precautions and have safety measures in place for us. I'm very glad for those of you who have done the training and are willing to take that task upon, <clears throat> take that responsibility upon. But I'm also, uh, <clears throat> I just had the weirdest um, reaction today when Dave Willis called me and asked me if I'd seen the news and then I went and, and got on the computer and looked to see what had happened. I just felt uh, so um, impassioned to do what we can as a church to take the gospel to people, uh, to tell people about Jesus, to tell people about the only one who can truly transform hearts. So I realize there's a lot of factors that go into these shootings. <clears throat> there's a lot of mental illness in our country. There's a lot, a lot of drug and substance abuse. There's a lot of racial and ethnic and religious hatred and animosity swelling up in our country. There's a lot of things like that that are going on that make each of these situations different and complicated. I recognize that. But just so that we don't feel hopeless, like there's not much we can do, I just want to remind all of us as Christians that teaching people about Jesus and showing people the love of Jesus are the way that we ultimately are going to make the difference in our world. And I hope you'll be... Uh, emboldened as we face a new year to do that. And then it's going to be 2020 if we are permitted by the Lord's grace to come back here on Wednesday. I remember vividly as an eighth grader one day trying to do the math to figure out how old I would be when the year 2000 came, which seemed like a century away. And now if the Lord wills, we're going to come together on Wednesday, and it's going to be 20 years past that. And I am sure, undoubtedly, there are going to be a lot of political campaign slogans this year in which candidates promise a 2020 vision, make a play off of that. I wanted to try to get the first one in. So that's what I'm going to do tonight, is I'm going to talk to you all about how to have a vision to become a better person in the next year. And uh, nothing I say this evening is, uh, is going to be profound at all. I'm going to try to give you seven points and a passage for each point. This is really just so much common sense, as it seems to me. And yet, as we all know, most of the time, the things that are amiss in our life are amiss uh, precisely because we are ignoring what is truly commonsensical. But I do want to give you some things tonight to consider if you have intentions to try to make some improvements in your life 
over the next year. And I ask you to turn here to begin in Galatians chapter 6. And the first point that I want to give you tonight is take responsibility for yourself. Don't blame your circumstances for what your life is. Don't blame other people for what your life is. Blame yourself for what your life is. Take responsibility for yourself. Now, this passage, as Phil read to it, on the, at first glance, does it sound like it's about personal responsibility at all because it opens by talking about other people. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is indeed a passage that really begins with focus on others. But here is the theme. You cannot be of any service to other people if you yourself are not where you need to be spiritually. It's kind of like when you get on a plane and if you have children and the flight attendants start to give the instructions and they say in the event of the loss of cabin pressure, masks will fall from the ceiling, first put one on yourself, right? And then start with your favorite child and work down. That's what they always say on Southwest. But I remember the first time I heard that announcement as a kid, I was thinking, what? Wait a minute. Weren't you supposed to start with me? Why does mom start first? Till I became an adult and realized if she kills over, there isn't going to be anybody to help me out. So what Paul is about to say is, well, yes, of course, you want to be there to help restore others who stumble, but you can only do so if you are spiritual, according to verse 1. And if you're keeping watch on yourself. And then he immediately goes into this realization that if there is any point in life in which pride can rear its ugly head, it is precisely at this point when we are helping others. Oh, look how much they need me. I am so wonderful, I am going to give them the help they need. Verse 3, if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself, but let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. Don't puff yourself up and think you're so wonderful because someone else has a problem you don't currently have in the same form. And then verse 5, each one will have to bear his own load. You'll notice two different words, right? In verse 2, your Bible should say burden, and in verse 5, it should say load. And here's the reason for the difference in that translation. The word burden refers to those overwhelming, crushing problems that are more than any of us can handle, like when a spouse becomes ill or when you lose your job or, or you have some other kind of terrible burden in life. The word load, though, refers to like a soldier's pack, which only he can carry. So you can imagine, for those of you who have been or, or are in the service, there may be a situation which you are out on duty in a deployment, and you all have your soldier's pack. And one of you may have an injury. You may get wounded, and, and it's going to be the duty of your, of your fellow comrades to help you up. But now you're still going to have to carry your pack and then help somebody else up as they deal with their burden. So the point that Paul is getting at here in this passage is, you can only be in position to help someone else when you are what you are supposed to be. You cannot be the kind of husband to a wife you are supposed to be if you are not first the man you are supposed to be. You cannot be the wife to your husband you're supposed to be unless you are first taking responsibility to be the woman in Christ that you are to be. And the same goes for being a parent. And the same goes for all the other relationships that we have. Um, Really, I would say in many respects, this is the foundational point. It's the most important point. Everything else follows from this. If you spend your life like King Saul in the Old Testament, always blaming other people for your failings. You remember the story in 1 Samuel 13. He's supposed to wait for Samuel to offer sacrifice. Samuel doesn't show up when he thinks he should. He takes it upon himself. Samuel shows up, rebukes him, and he says, well, the people, they were, they were starting to, to abandon ship, and, and they were starting to desert. And, and you, you didn't show up when you said you would. 
It's always other people's fault. Chapter 15, the story of the, the battle with Agag, king of the Amalekites. Well, the, the people wanted to take the stuff. And, I mean, it's always everybody else's fault. That's why Saul doesn't change. In fact, if anything, he only changes for the worse. And it's the reason, by contrast, that King David, who on paper does far worse things than King Saul, adultery and conspiracy to murder, you'd have to agree on paper or much worse, but he is willing to change because he is willing to say, I have sinned against the Lord. If you do not take personal responsibility, if you do not realize that you are the one who is ultimately responsible for your life, you will never change. And if you never change, your circumstances will never change. And a year from now, we will be on the cusp of 2021, and you're going to wonder why I'm always in this same rut. So number one, <clears throat> be responsible for yourself. That's the only way you can change, and it's the only way that you can be what you need to be for others. So take responsibility for yourself. Secondly, look with me in Colossians chapter 3. Know how you want the story to end and work backwards. Know how you want the story to end and work backwards. What do I mean by that? Well, here's what Paul says in Colossians. Did I say Colossians? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. What's Paul talking about there? He's talking about how we all want the story to end, right? How do we want the story to end? Be with Christ forever in glory, right? Now, he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to begin by setting your mind with Christ on things above, thinking about what you want your ultimate destiny to be. Look at verse 5. Put to death, therefore. And then from the rest of this chapter, he says, either you put to death, that is, you stop doing these things, or verse 12, you put on, then, these things, Either there are things you've been doing you need to stop doing, or the things you're not doing you need to start doing. But did you see all of that stems from this point? Do you want to go be with Christ forever? If so, here's what you need to do to get there. So this is so simple when it comes to things like taking a trip, right? When you know what your destination is, you can then work to figure out how you're going to get there. But you have to know what your destination is. And what Paul is saying is, if you want to know how to lead your life, you have to begin with how you want the story to end, and then you work backwards. In other words, all the decisions you make leading up to that point are guided by where you want to get to. So what does this mean on practical terms? This year... If you are a young person and you think about you think about maybe dating, you think about talking it up with somebody, you think about hanging out with somebody, all that you do in that process, according to what Paul says here, needs to be motivated by this goal. I want to go be with Christ forever. Now then, what kind of person do I want to hang out with? Because if I want to go be with Christ forever, and I know there are some people who are not going to make that easy, who are the people that I should be hanging out with? Or, for example, if you are thinking about going to college, you're about to graduate, and you're thinking about what you want to do for school. The way that you begin to make that decision is by first saying, I want to go be with Christ forever. Now, how can that guide the decisions I make about where I go to school? or what I do for a job, or where I live. All of these decisions in life, which face all of us at the different ages and, and stages of development in life, 
are made far simpler if we always are making them because we are working backwards from heaven, Christ, glory, eternal union with God in love. So let that be the way that you make these decisions in life. Let it be the way that you govern the decisions you make every day. Let that be the way that you govern any resolutions that maybe you want to make over the next few days. So take responsibility for yourself. You are going to write the script for your life. Number two, how do you want that script to end? When the closing credits are rolling, it's, oh, I'm with the Lord Jesus Christ forever in glory. That's how this story is going to end. And now then, once you know that, keep the main thing the main thing. Look with me over in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'm trying as you may see, to get every cliche I could think of crammed into one sermon tonight. Because I'm just trying to emphasize the point, cliches become cliche because they're common sense. That's why they become cliche. Matthew chapter 6. This is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And the Lord Jesus says this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you drink, about your body, what you will put on. Is not your life more than food, the body more than clothing? You can almost imagine on this mountaintop that right as he says this, a flock of birds fly over. And he says, look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns that your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Verse 28, why are you anxious about clothing? Consider, and then you can just see him, right? He's, he's pointing out to flowers. The lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon on his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, unbelievers, pagans, those who don't know God, seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The righteous reign of God in your life. And all these things will be added to you. Now, of course, we know that our Lord Jesus doesn't mean that as the man of the house, as parents, that you can just completely ignore any responsibilities to take care of your family. We know you've got to read the Bible in its full context, and we know the Scripture says pretty fair amounts about those sorts of responsibilities. The point is to keep the main thing the main thing, to keep first things first. Yes, of course, you want to make sure that you've got something to eat. And yes, of course, you want to make sure that you have clothes to wear. But that is not the main thing. The main thing is to seek the righteous reign of God in your life first. Because here is the thing. You may have the most noble aspiration of all to go be with Christ forever. That's how you want the story to end. But the way that in practical terms you work backwards is you have to order your life and prioritize your life in such a way that day by day the choices you are making reflect that priority. The reality is this. The things that make the most difference in our pursuit of God and drawing closer to him are not things that have an alarm or a whistle that that are going to go off. The other day, which is sort of a frequent happening in my house, I caused the smoke alarms to go off because it's something I was trying to cook. That's a pretty normal occurrence at my place. Prayer, there's no alarm that goes off for that. I mean, y'all ever heard one? I've never heard an emergency alarm go off to say, you should read your Bible today. 
I, I've never heard a whistle go off to say, oh, now's the time I'm supposed to spend in close communication with my wife or my husband or my children. You see, all those things that John and Ronnie have talked about, about what you do to spend time and invest time in your kids, those are things that you have to make time for because you recognize they are a priority because you want your children's story to end like you want your story to end, which is with Christ forever. But you also know that if you don't intentionally create that space for those things, life and all of its busyness and anxiety, what Jesus has been talking about, it's just going to fill in and cram it in. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've made resolutions about praying more often or reading scripture more often, and then the press of day-to-day -day life and responsibility sweeps in, and if I don't intentionally carve out that time, you know what happens? I get to the end of a week, and I stop and think, and I realize I didn't do anything I said I was going to. So you have to make a commitment. If you know where you want to go and you know the path that's going to get you there, you have to keep first things first. You have to, in the moment of choice, make decisions that reflect that priority. All right, you with me so far? We're almost halfway there, all right? Here's number four. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now you may think, well, we're going to go where Jesus actually said that, right? Well, we could, but since you all know that passage so well, let's go to just a different one that says the same thing. Would you go with me to Philippians, the second chapter? Philippians, the second chapter. You know, it's, it occurred to me a few years ago uh, when I preached through the book of Philippians with you all that... Um, while a lot of times we think of Philippians as the book of joy, you know, that's the focus of the book, that it's actually a book that talks about unity. It may even talk about unity more perverse than any other book in the New Testament. And this is a classic passage. It starts off in verse 1 with a series of rhetorical questions, the answer of which is always yes. If there's any encouragement in Christ, yes. Any comfort from love, yes. Any participation in the Spirit, check. Any affection and sympathy, you got it. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. See all the emphasis on unity? Well, how do we do that, Paul? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which is in Christ, yours in Christ, and so forth. But do you see that statement there in verse 4? Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. That's just another way of saying, love your neighbor as yourself. And in practical terms, what it means is this that I have to have a mindset that is just every bit as much committed to your good, to your benefit, to your happiness, as much as I am committed to mine. And of course, when Jesus says, love your neighbors yourself, he's sort of assuming it's just going to be our natural innate tendency to love ourselves, right? To to have an interest in what we want. It's sort of what Paul's getting at here in verse 3 where, when he said, count others more significant than yourselves. You're going to already have just an innate sense of, I want to take care of me. And what he's trying to get us to do is the same thing the Lord Jesus is doing, which is to say, okay, yeah, you want to make sure that you're taken care of, but you've got to look out for your neighbor first. Seek what is in their best interest first. Have a mindset that doesn't say this. There's only one pie. And there's only so many pieces. And I got to make sure I get most of those pieces. But have a mindset that says, we can always make more pies. And we can make the one you like. In fact, I think it would be great if the sisters and interested brothers of this congregation in an effort to show their interest in this lesson and their willingness to take it to heart, 
would, refl- would reflect this. And I say this with nothing but your best interest in mind by making multiple kinds of pies to share so that we all feel deep down inside the point of this lesson. Well, you all get what I'm saying here. It's going to be very easy, us, easy for us if we are self-centered to only think about what we want, what we need, what will make us happy. Paul says if we truly want to be, in verse 2, of the same mind, same love, full accord, and having one mind, we have to have a mindset that sees that happiness is not a finite, limited quantity. There is an endless supply of it that we can mutually seek for one another so that we all truly have joy and happiness and what we desire. Well, how do I know what would please my neighbor? Listen before you speak. Look with me over in James chapter 1. Now, James chapter 1, the verse we're going to read, I almost don't have to turn and read it because we all, I think, probably have heard this verse many times, but there is a small nuance I want to point out to you that's a difference in translations. Now, the punchline of verse 19 is, of course, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And, of course, what James is saying here is not simply that you should be slow to speak and listen first, that is kind of this point, but he also recognizes that if you are quick to speak rather than to listen, anger is almost always the result. Haven't you found that to be the case? When you are quick to speak rather than listen, when you're quick to retort, that almost always triggers anger. And then as he goes on to say here, that doesn't, generally speaking, produce the righteousness of God. Here's the detail that I wanted to point out to you. Those of you who read the New American Standard Bible, yours starts like this in verse 19. This you know my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear. As if to say, well, everybody knows this, be quick to hear. But you gotta ask yourself, does everybody really know that? I don't think so, I certainly don't. The English Standard Version more correctly translates this, know this. In other words, it's not a statement of what we all already know, it is a command to know what we often don't know. You see the difference? Know this, my beloved brothers. Listen up. Learn this. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So the point is, this is not something that naturally comes to us. But for those of us who are committed to loving our neighbor, we need to know, well, then what does my neighbor need for me to love him? What is it that would pursue the interest of my neighbor? So, you got to ask, and you've got to be willing to listen before you respond. And of course, listening here doesn't simply mean that like a parrot, whatever they say you could say back, although I got to be honest, in the culture we live in, where it's hard to get people to stop looking at their phones and iPads for five minutes, if you can just get somebody to actually repeat the words you've just said, That's quite a victory nowadays. But of course, to truly listen in a deeper, more fundamental way is not just simply to hear syllables, but it's actually to be able to to hear what's on someone's heart. In fact, to even be able to go deeper than that and feel what is on their heart so you truly can see where they are coming from. This is the verse that Ronnie mentioned this morning in his excellent Bible class in 1 Peter chapter 3, where Peter says to husbands, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Seek to truly understand. That's what all of us are called upon to do, to understand one another. Now then, once we do that, we can pursue a way to find something that is truly mutually beneficial. But to do that, we cannot be locked into a my way versus your way. So my sixth point for us tonight is look for the best way, not just your way. And the passage I want you to consider with me on this point is in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Verse 
this passage starts out by recognizing that when you have growth, growth comes with problems. They're not bad problems, but it's just a reality. There are problems. That's, we have, we've experienced this. I, I think, Lord willing, we're going to experience this even more, that as we grow, we're going to face some problems. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Hellenist refers to those who speak Greek. And in this context, it would refer to Jewish widows who speak Greek. Hebrews refers to Jewish widows who speak Hebrew. So there is an ethnic difference here. Just like we've seen ethnic differences recently in the news between those who are more traditional and those who are more cosmopolitan. And that ethnic difference has led to a neglect of some of these widows in the benevolent care of the church. You just think about in our culture how um, explosive any issues connected with race and ethnicity can be. Now, you tie into that an issue about money, and it's not money like wealth, but I mean it's like daily care, daily bread to eat. And you've got an issue on your hands that could have been explosive. You realize there's a possible reality out there in which this could have caused the church in Jerusalem to disintegrate. So, verse 2, the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will ourselves uh, devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So here's what the apostles could have done. The apostles could have said, we are too busy to take care of this growing, burgeoning problem you take care of it yourself. That would have caused this situation, I think, to ignite. On the other hand, the apostles could have said, well, I guess we're going to have to stop doing what we are uniquely commissioned to do in order to roll up our sleeves and do this work of serving tables. Neither of those options is mutually beneficial there are women who need food, and the apostles need to do their work, and the church needs them to do their work. But rather than get locked into some artificial distinction between the apostles' way versus the way of the women, the apostles say, here's another option. It's a third way, and it's a way for you to be fed and us to keep doing our work. We're going to choose men who can devote themselves to this work. Verse 5 says what they said, please the whole gathering. And then you can see here that they chose these seven men. The two most famous, of course, are Stephen and Philip. And then verse 7 says the word of God continue to increase. The number of the disciples multiply greatly rather than causing a problem. This solution causes a mutual benefit such that the number grows. And even a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So you have to be so committed to loving your neighbor as yourself and so committed to listening before you speak that you are willing to say, well, you know, I had this idea and you had that idea, but maybe there's an even better idea and if we work on it, we will come up with it and lo and behold, you will find it. You will find not my way, not your way, but the best way, a third way. Now, here's the only way that that can happen. You have to be mature enough that you don't get locked into some kind of proprietary mindset in which your self-esteem is dependent on getting your way. Look back up at point number one. Take responsibility for yourself. Some of you may work with someone whose entire esteem revolves around always crushing other people to get their way. I hope you don't work with somebody like that. But I bet some of you have. And when a person has that mindset, while on the surface they may appear to be strong and mature and powerful, 
you and I know that a person like that is actually weak and dependent and immature because they are dependent on artificial power grabs and trips for their self-esteem. So you have to be really mature to say, I think there's a better way, and we haven't thought of it yet, but if we work together, we can find it. And so if you want to have a better year for your family next year, then this is the kind of thing you're going to have to really sink yourself into, is the commitment to say when you have those disputes, maybe we can find a better way. Now, sometimes you can't. I remember when Christy and I were dating, and things were getting really, really serious, and of course, they were serious for her, just like that. But anyway, as they were getting really, really serious, we realized we had a problem. <clears throat> uh, she had cats, and I'm deathly, and I'm literally deathly allergic. You lock me in a room with them, 24 hours later, there'd be no more shame. And so we talked for hours about what to do about this. And I kept trying to find a solution, a third way. You know, uh, how can you keep your cats and I still live? All right, that's what we're shooting for here. Those are the options. That's a mutually beneficial outcome. And we talked, and, and, but everything we tried to think of to find a third way to do this, it just wasn't, it just wasn't gonna work. And I remember we, I don't know why it sticks out in my mind like this, but we had, we'd pulled into the parking lot of the congregation uh, where we worshiped, where I preached, and we were sitting there, and we just kind of came to the realization, there is not going to be a third way here. There's not going to be any other way. It's either me or the cats, and I just did not want to make my wife to have to make that decision. So I decided to take an L. I decided to lose to the cats. And the way that I lost to the cats was I started taking allergy shots twice a week, every week for months to have cat goo shoved into my veins. <clears throat> Any one of which shots could have caused me anaphylactic shock and sudden death. But I did it. I, did, I think that's heroism, right? Well, I'm being kind of silly. The point is, there are times when you're trying to find a, a, a mutually satisfactory satisfactory uh, outcome and you may not be able to find it and that gives you the opportunity to tell the person you love that you want to show them how much you love them by being willing to sacrifice for them and while in the short term you may consider that a loss in the long term that's the kind of thing that creates a huge win for both of you and of course I don't have to tell you that if we were keeping score, Christy gave up a whole lot more for me than I ever did for her. All right, here's one last point. If you want next year to be different than this year, sharpen your ax. This is actually right out of the Bible. This is, is, isn't even a cliche. I'm turning over to the book of Ecclesiastes, to Ecclesiastes chapter 10, a section of the book of Ecclesiastes which contains a series of Proverbs. When I read this, you're going to say, wait, are you sure that's not in Proverbs? It's not. It's right here in Ecclesiastes, written by the same guy, of course. But Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 10, if the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. I bet some of you are like me and you have if you cook at all, in your kitchen, a set of knives that you have to press down with almost all your weight to get them to cut through a tomato. And others of you are going, why, dummy? Sharpen them, and it'll make life easier. But I'm too lazy to do that. But of course, the irony is, it just makes it all the more difficult and all the more, uh, more challenging to do what I'm trying to do. Ecclesiastes is drawing on a very similar kind of analogy, except it's an axe, an iron axe head. And you can see this lumberjack, this ancient Israelite, as far as that goes, and he's out and he's trying to chop down a tree, and his axe has become dull with use. And rather than just take a few minutes 
to sharpen up that axe head, he just keeps sweating furiously and laboriously trying to chop a tree down with a dull axe. Now, what do you think the wise man meant when he said, wisdom helps one to succeed? Well, what he's saying here is, you've got to take time to sharpen your axe. In other words, you've got to invest in just a little bit of time to maintain yourself. What do I mean by that? I mean spending just a little bit of time with just you and God to sharpen the axe of your spiritual walk with God. I mean taking just a little bit of time, really, in deep conversation with your spouse to connect together, a little bit of time with your children, a little bit of time with your brothers and sisters in Christ. So far as I am concerned, when the New Testament talks about these assemblies being a place where we build each other up, as far as I'm concerned, spiritually, you know what we're doing here? As iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. What you and I do when we come together is we're just taking a little bit of time to sharpen the ax, to do something to renew ourselves spiritually so we can be ready for the task at hand. Just having a mindset that says, I'm not going to be content with how I am. I believe I can sharpen the axe and make myself just a little bit more capable in the service of God. Just a little bit more capable as a husband or wife or parent or child or brother or sister in Christ. So these are seven things. None of them are magical. There's nothing particularly complicated about any of these things. They're actually not difficult at all, but they're not easy. Because none of these things really come inherently natural to us, unless we commit to them. But if we do, I think we can have some confidence that if the Lord wills and by His mercy we assemble here again about a year from now, if you devoted yourself yourself to these things, then you would find yourself as a person closer to the Lord, You would find your marriage stronger, your relationship with your children healthier, and your ability to serve in the Lord's kingdom even that much more dynamic. So think about these things over the next few days as you prepare to bring the new year in. You know, as I often tell you guys, after I get done preaching, I take a look at my notes and I see what did I leave out? And always frustrates me because there's always something I left out that I really, really wanted to say. And at the end of the sermon this morning, I left out something. I even had it highlighted in yellow so as not to forget, and I completely forgot. And the point that I wanted to make toward the end of the lesson was this. You remember we read a couple of passages this morning. One is from Luke 18 where Jesus promised that if we have to leave houses and wives and parents and children and brothers and sisters for the sake of the kingdom that we will receive many times more in this life. And then at the end of the lesson I read from Hebrews chapter 2 where the writer tells us that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and even quotes a passage in which Jesus basically says to the Father, Behold, I and the children you've given me. And, And here was how I wanted to end the lesson this morning and I just completely forgot. When Jesus promised that if we will commit ourselves to the kingdom of God, that we will receive many more times in this life what we have to give up. Jesus practiced what he preached. Because Jesus, although for a time in his life, did not have the greatest relationship with his brothers, because he committed himself to God, he received far more than four brothers. Our Lord Jesus Christ has created a family of innumerable brothers and sisters. So Jesus practiced what he preached. And through him we can see that his promise is sure. So tonight if there's anything we can do to help you to in a way fulfill that promise of Jesus by becoming a part of his family or encourage you as a child of God to focus on the things that can help you draw nearer to him in this upcoming year. Let us know while we stand and sing together.